Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. We'd like to encourage you to open up your Bibles to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 will be our scripture reading for today. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. All right, I know you've got your Bibles open. I know there's some sermon notes outside. Hopefully you pick those up. You have a pen to take notes. That's important. All of this is designed so that we spend time studying and focusing on God's Word together. I don't know about you, but I have this problem now that I've gotten older. I work all week long, and then I sit in this comfortable, cozy chair, relaxing. And the next thing I notice is my eyelids feel like they're 50 pounds. The, war, the air in the room feels a little bit warmer than normal. I'm comfortable. And soon, my head begins to drop. Why? Because I'm not engaged. If you want to keep yourself from falling asleep, besides that wonderful voice I have to put you to sleep, that's like magic. I should be selling that. <laughs> Take notes. Be engaged in the scripture. That will help you uh, to fight that. Now, I don't judge you for falling asleep because if I had you up here, I would have to be fighting the exact same thing. So it's not, a, it's not you know, if you're sitting by somebody who's doing this to you the whole time, there's space here. <laughs> Move over a chair. Okay. All right. So I've got all that. Let's open a word of prayer and get into the word of God. Lord, we just ask for your guidance direct, direction today. Help us to understand your truth so that we might be men and women that have a clear understanding of how you communicate to us this morning. And that we might be changed because of that. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As a young boy, there was a place on the river that we would go fishing. The river was split by an island, and a cove was created. In the summer, we would position our boat at the end of the island where the currents would meet. It was important not to get too close to the island because the bugs in Maine were relentless in their feeding. Their feeding happened to be us. At the same time, we didn't want to get too far away from the island because the current was strong enough to pull us down the river. In the small cove of the island, we could fish free from the constant attack of the bugs and enjoy the soothing, rocking feeling of the boat while we waited for the fish to bite. 
Now, none of this would have been possible if we had neglected to bring our anchor. The anchor kept us, kept our boat from drifting into the current. And the author of Hebrews writes to the believer who may not be using their anchors in their life and may be drifting away from the sure foundation that they have in Christ. We need to be assured of our position in life. There is a right and there is a wrong. It is imperative for the believer to know the difference between the two. It seems so easy to make the distinction. But how often have you heard someone say, lives and living the life is more about being in the gray than living in the black and the white? People don't really live in black and white. I mean, we want that color. We want that full experience of the spectrum. But Scripture speaks specifically to that problem. You see, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's what Paul writes to the Corinthians. And we shouldn't be surprised by the way people act, because their minds have been blinded from the truth. Again, Paul writing to the Corinthians a second time, he says, whose minds, minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So, while that's true, we should evaluate ourselves and see how much have we been influenced. We need to evaluate our current ideas against the Scripture and ask, is this what Scripture's teaching? Do my thoughts align with the teaching of Jesus? Over the last weeks, we are reminded that ideas have consequences. A Christian school shooting by a young transgender person took place this week. A famous pastor, who I'm sure many of you have read his books, declared that women should be pastors. And many church denominations have pivoted have decided that the most important thing that they could declare to people today is social justice. All of mankind's struggles begin with his view or her view on the Word of God. How do you treat or respond to the Word of God? The first struggle began in the, in the Garden of Eden. And we witness this in Genesis. And that same struggle ends with the last chapter in the book of Revelation. It's over, how are you going to respond to what the Word of God says? Well, Eve was in the garden, and the serpent, serpent asked her a question to create doubt. He says, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? So in other words, didn't God just kind of say, you have permission to eat of everything? And then, next, a serpent follows the statement to create distrust and to distort. You will not surely die. For God knows that the day that you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will know good and evil. Hmm. Isn't that great? You will move up and you will be like Him, and then you really have, you'll be equals. Well, there is a right and there is a wrong. Or is life really more about that gray area? Well, sound doctrine will help us to understand what we believe. It should help us to know what we should not believe also. It should show us what we should not do and, of course, what we should do. We began our doctrinal uh, series by studying about God. And now we turn to our Bible the Bible, which I hope all of you are holding. And this book that, that we hold is unique. It's unique out of all the books that have ever been written. You say, well, how so? Well, first, it was written over a 1,500-year time period by 40, at least 40 different authors from a wide variety of backgrounds. We've got some great men like kings who have added to it, and then we have some just flat-out nobodies, some murderers who have written to this. You look at just the background of the people who have written in this, you're like, 
Who would collect these people to write a book like this? And then the book is split into two sections. There's an Old Testament, which comprises, comprises of 39 books. And then there's a New Testament, which is made up of 27 books. We believe that this book is to be the verbal, plenary, inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. You're saying that's a mouthful. Yes? Yes. So in a nutshell, what are we saying? We believe that the Bible can be trusted and it is the authority for our life. In everything that it addresses, it's the authority. Now, the Bible does not tell us whether we should have an iPhone or an Android. Use your wisdom in deciding what you're going to spend your money on in that area. But when the Bible talks about specific things on how a person should get saved, it's specific. It leaves no doubt. When the Bible talks and gives you guidelines on your, on your purity... It's specific. It doesn't say, well, you know, do your best and hope for the best. It says, here's what you're supposed to do. All right. In that area, it's an authority for our life. So you see that. How do we know that God speaks to man? I think that's a fair question. How can we be sure that God really has communicated to mankind? Because after all, based on our previous study, we, want, we begin with this idea, does God even exist? And we went through and we stated that God does not try to prove that he exists. He just assumes that mankind recognizes that. Well, that being the case, we look at one of the most beautiful psalms written in Scripture. And, to, and in this, we see there are two ways that the author, David, observes how God communicates with mankind. So our passage today is divided in three parts. First, we have the wordless revelation. Then we have the spoken revelation. And then we find just the application of revelation. Because remember, David, although we know him as king, before that profession, he was a shepherd. He spent a lot of time out in the fields, out in the pastures, shepherding sheep. He had a lot of free time on his hand. What do you do when you are a rancher or a farmer and you wait? It gives you a lot of time to think about things. And in this, you can imagine that someone who is writing poetry, this is a little bit different from what we normally study, Poetry is a way to express emotions in a way a person feels. So we don't want to become so mechanical that we miss that the emotion and the feeling that David has here. It's important and imperative that we capture that and we see that. Because Psalm 19 is expressing how he feels towards the way God is communicating. And then, his, the last part of it, what he actually does about it. And how he feels about that. So, in Psalm 19, we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. We're going to look at the wordless revelation. The wordless revelation. And to start off in theology, there's a thing called general revelation. And let me just give you a definition. The definition of that is, truths God has revealed about himself to all mankind through nature, providential control, and conscience. This is also sometimes called natural revelation in theology. What does God reveal about himself through nature? We've all been in awe at sunsets or sunrises. We've seen the delicate wings of a hummingbird jetting to and fro from flower to flower. We are thrilled at a rainbow because how often do we say, look, there's a rainbow, and we stop what we're doing and we point it out to somebody else. If it's a rainbow or a double rainbow, we're just... Ooh, and then we are at awe at the brilliance of the colors that we see there. But we have to think beyond just the pretty pictures that we see out there. Because although we look over our creation and we see the magnificent colors and the spectacular things that are there, we know that that was not by accident. Somebody must have designed all of this to take place. Now, we don't go to museums... And look at the paintings and go, wow, that was an accident. Although there is some modern painting that looks like it's an accident. I'll, I'll grant that. But even still, you know that somebody 
did that accident on purpose. So there is a design behind that. Even those who take buckets and throw them at the wall and, and you see all of that still. But you see, there's a creator behind those things. Right? So general, general revelation is just here's some truth that God has designed or revealed is perhaps a better way to say this for all people to know. Now, what's communicated? That's the important thing. David perhaps is out shepherding, as I mentioned one day, and his meditation turns towards the creation. And verses 1 through 6, he says, And the heavens declare the glory of God. All the heavens declare the glory of God. How can that be? In fact, he says, And the firmaments show his handiwork. Not only does he, as he looks up into the sky and he says, All of this reveals that God is a glorious God. But then he, he adds to that, because that's how Hebrew uh, parallelism works. The first statement is sort of a general big thing, and then the second one below is sort of a, let me add to this in a more specific way. So, all this is the glory of God, and you say, well, okay, the second line is, and the firmament, the expanse, shows his handiwork, or shows his fingerprint, or shows that he has been at work. We look at a car, we go, a car is an amazing thing, but then we go to we say that we're wonderful and it's impressive and all that stuff. But then we go to the factory. And the factory is where that fingerprint of all those engineers, creators, and so forth have worked together to design and develop this car. The same thing with what David is saying here. He's saying all of this is just an amazing thing and this is his handiwork. Paul picks up the exact same thought in Romans chapter 1. So you have that piece of paper there. Hold, put a sp- we're going to come right back to Psalm, but I also want you to go to Romans chapter 1. Because in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 20, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Meaning they're holding it down, they're hindering it from being seen. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Paul is basically saying, man knows that God exists. Man sees even the invisible things of God and attributes them to him and is aware of God's existence. And points to the fact, but instead of glorifying God and acknowledging God's existence, instead he will just hide and pretend, that's not God. That's not God. Let's go back to Psalm 19. David understood these things about God from his creation. And here's what we learn about God in in 19. God uses his creation to speak over time. Look at verse 2. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. So day and night, God is speaking. But verse 3 tells us, wait a minute, there is no speech nor language. There is no, where their voice is not heard. What is he talking about? God uses his creation to speak to all mankind. The people on the island in the Pacific or the people in an apartment in an overpopulated city. God is using the same message of creation to speak to them. And the message has has gone out strong and clear. And I like the illustration that he uses here. In verse 4 he says, Their line has gone out, or their business has gone out throughout all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. And in them he has sent a tabernacle for the sun, or a tent for the sun. So in other words, there's a point where the sun is dark. Like what? Yeah, before sunrise. Which is, and then, which is like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. When the sun comes up early in the morning, it just blasts forth, doesn't it? It's like, yes, here I am. Now, when a bridegroom comes out of the chamber, the bridegroom comes out and goes, here I am, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the bridegroom. Proud, excited, I'm the man. And no one's going to doubt the bridegroom and go, yeah, but nope. The bridegroom goes, I'm married. The smile on his face cannot be denied. 
the sun coming up cannot be denied. Here it comes. And he continues that. He's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man running the race. The strong man running the race is like, I know the direction I'm going. I am prepared. I see the line. I'm headed for it. What can stop the strong man? Nothing. What can hinder him? Nope, he's prepared. What is going to slow down the sun from moving from point A to run its race? Nothing. Rising from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end, there is nothing to hinder it or to, nothing hidden from its heat. So as the sun is moving, it doesn't say nothing is hidden from its light. Isn't that interesting? Because we would automatically think, wait a minute, some things can hide in the shade that it creates. No, it says nothing is hindered from its heat. Even those of us, as we know, summer's coming. By the way, it's supposed to be 80 degrees on Sunday next week. Can you imagine that? It's cold this morning. Now it's supposed to be hot next week. When that sun comes out and that heat clicks on, even in the shade, we are feeling it, its effect. Now, what is David saying about the Word of God? He's saying the message of creation is simple and clear. There is a God. <laughs> and that message of there is a God is universally sent to all people and everybody is aware of it. To the ancient man, it would be important for the ancient man to know which God created all of this because they worship, worship many gods. To the modern man who wants to believe that everything happened by chance has to recognize, wait a minute, this isn't all chance. There is no way all of this could be chance. There are too many, there's too, much, too many things that are functioning the way they are. Take human relationships, for instance. All of our systems, cardiovascular, neurological, all those things are dependent and independent you have your own, I have my own. Except for one system that requires us to get together. Reproduction. If the human race is to go on, some of us have one half of it and the other have the other half. And if the society is to continue on, according to God's word, be fruitful and multiply. Ah, isn't that amazing? Why, if evolution is true, why did reproduction, perhaps one of the most important things for the survival of creation, not be enfolded all in each individual person? So in other words, why couldn't all of us just reproduce all of our, in ourselves? Not only us, but the whole animal kingdom along with it. The whole insect kingdom. All the birds. Almost like someone developed us according to a kind. Just like scripture says. If there is a designer, who is that designer? Well, the Apostle Paul addresses the people at Athens and, co and commended them for their religious or their spirituality. He says, they even had an altar to an unknown God, which Paul then declared to identify and reveal who the unknown God was. He says, the unknown God that you worship is the creator God. Oh, by the way, he has a name. His name is Jesus Christ. So general revelation, or natural revelation, is God's wordless message to all mankind, really pointing him back to that there is a God. And it's a sad statement that we find in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. God's goal was not for recognition. God was not trying to get all mankind to say, look, yes, we acknowledge that there is a God. That's not God's goal. God's goal has always been one of relationship. In order for man to have a relationship with God, it would have to have some sort of direct communication, which leads us to our second point. And the second thing that David comes up with, if we look at verses 7 through 10, we see the spoken revelation, or I have, in your, uh, so, yeah, I have it written down in your notes here, 7 through 10, and spoken revelation is special revelation. If we define special revelation, it's God's truths, that God has revealed through Jesus Christ and Scripture to specific people. We call this specific or supernatural revelation in theology. 
special revelation is seen as the words that God spoke. Now, we see this throughout Scripture. Every, like, for example, in Exodus 20, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke all these words, saying, like, okay, so <laughs> this is God's message to a particular group of people. Or when we're reading through, when we hear, thus says the Lord, or the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet said, and said, we know, like, here we go, here is specific messages where God is speaking to people. Special revelation reveals the path of salvation. Something specific that God says, you need to know this, because this is going to save you. This is going to help you. So what is communicated here in verse 7 through 10? And David says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yes, much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and honeycombs. David, if you notice, describes the word of God and what's being communicated with six words. Six different words he uses to describe and tell us about God's word. He calls it the law. He calls it a testimony or statutes or commandments or reverence or fear and judgments. These are all different phrases, all referring back to the Word of God, the revealed Word of God to mankind. But David also tells us about the quality of God's Word. He says God's Word is perfect. It's sure. It's right. It's pure. It's clean. It's enduring. It's true. It's righteous. It's desirable. He says all of these things about God's word for us, that we might understand it and also, like David, seek after it. And then, having said all these things, this is extremely important because David expresses the impact of God's word. Although he identifies, man, God's word is amazing, but here's what it does. It converts the soul. It makes a person's person wise. It causes rejoicing in the, in the heart and enlightening the eyes. Well, what do we mean by that? What does David mean by this? Paul writes Timothy, and he says, reminding Timothy, he, he tells him how God's word had an influence upon him. He says, from childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. If you spend some time and you read the book of Psalms and Ecclesiastes, you will gain great wisdom in just reading these books. You will find great, not just knowledge of you're smarter and you'll maybe do better on trivia pursuit games. That's true. But what you'll find in life, you're going, huh, Somebody a thousand years is dealing with the same issues I'm dealing with here in the 21st century. How can that be? Man is going through the same issues. So the Word of God will help you become wiser. It enlightens the mind. The Mosaic Law told the people of Israel how God would bless them for being obedient. And it also told them how they would be punished for disobedience. The instructions in God's word was very clear for people. God made it very clear. So there wasn't like, Lord, it was an accident. I didn't mean to pick up that rock and hit my neighbor in the head with it. Really? You didn't? Well, my neighbor, and you go, well, then you find out, how far apart were you from your neighbor? Two feet. So your neighbor's standing right there, and you picked up a rock and you hit him in the head. How is that possible? Well, I was angry at them. Oh, I see. So this idea of smashing your neighbor in the head, is that forbidden? Yes. You cannot do those type of things. That seems like common sense. Is it common sense today? Where we have cities 
where kids are being shot and killed left and right? And where are the adults and why are they not standing up and say, we are done, enough? No, instead we say, get rid of all the rocks. <laughs> that, when are we going to stand up and say, we are no longer going to accept behavior like this and those who do bad things are going to be punished. You do, not, you do not get to be part of our society for behaving like this. Well, the Word of God gives clear instruction for us. It also for salvation. How does a person learn about salvation? The jailer asked Paul, what must I do in order to be saved? There is no guessing because the question is so important. The answer cannot be a sort of right or a generally correct. It must be specific because the life of the individual who is asking the question is depending upon it. So when the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? If I was the Apostle Paul, I would first say, get me out of these chains. Let me out of jail. That's not what the Apostle Paul says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Here's the message. You want your life to be transformed and changed. Turn to Christ. Turn to one who loved you enough to die for you and die for your sins and rose again the third day. It's not a myth. He wasn't just a good man. Eyewitness accounts showed him. Outside the Bible, there's even other resources outside of the Bible that identify him and the influence that he had upon the first century. Well, special revelation affirms that the Bible is God-breathed. Therefore, it's entirely reliable concerning everything that's addressed. So how should we apply it? That's really the big thing that I, that I want to draw our attention to. As David thought about these great truths of the way that God communicates to man through his creation and through his word, the Bible, the question has to be considered, now what should I do if God is speaking to me all through creation and I'm looking out and, yep, there's a God, and through his word, God is saying, I desire a relationship with you. What should I do? How should I behave? What is the influence? And I could say, I'm not interested. No, thank you. That would be one response. Here's David's response. In verse 10, this is how he viewed it. He said, God's word, God's revelation is to be desired more than gold, more than fine gold. It is sweeter than honey, sweeter than the honeycomb. Are we under the divine influence of God's word? Can we say that we desire God and his word more than anything else? The psalmist also writes in Psalm 119, verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart so I may not sin against you. And yet our whole society seems to be pushing for the pursuit of wealth. Get a college degree so you can earn lots of money and you can be rich. And you can have great health care. And you have more degrees and go with more education because that is the truth. That's how you're going to be healthy and happy and wealthy and that was going to somehow your education is going to solve everything that's not what the bible talks about and i'm not against education i have quite a bit of education so i'm not knocking it we have a school that pushes mastery of reading and writing and arithmetic know your history know the word of god you should be able to, when someone gives you change back, you should be able to look at the change in your hand and go, yep, that's right. You shouldn't be, well, wait a minute, let me pull out my calculator and figure it out. You should know these things. When someone says, you know, how much is 10% off of a dollar? When someone pulls out a calculator, you should be scratching, what? What school did you go to? She should go, I know that. That should be a simple, easy task. That's, so we're pro-education. But here in the thing that, that David is talking about here, he says, pursue God. It's rare to meet somebody who is pursuing God. That they value above all other things, they value God. They're devoting their time. They're devoting their energy. And you can see that by the amount of time that they're spending studying, reading, memorizing God's Word. 
I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I'm just saying this is what David, David is saying, look, go after God's revelation more than gold, more than wealth, and more than things that you do, more than chocolate, sweets, more than the things that are just fun. So how should we value it? And this is how David values these things. In verse 11, Moreover, by them your servant, me, I, is warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from, his, from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. For then I will be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgressions. In other words, your word convicts us of sin, Lord. It tells us how we really are. Your word is like a mirror and reveals to me exactly who I am. I'm a 10. I'm a great looking man. The Bible says, no, you're not. Let me tell you who you really are. You're a sinner with these flaws. But you are under grace because Christ loves you. And he values you. And it's time for you to start seeing your worth and your value in him. Instead of by the world's standards. It provides a means for forgiveness. This is how you can get right with God. He tells you here. It provides a correct perspective of how we should live our life. My attitude is I want to be blameless. As opposed to I just don't want to be caught. My attitude towards sinning. I want to guard myself from sin. I don't want sin to be the, the characteristic where people recognize that, that that's what dominates me. I want to be a man of God. He says, my words and thoughts are measured by what God would deem acceptable. In verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. So in other words, what he's saying is, I want what... what comes into my mind to be acceptable to God. What comes out of my mouth that God would say, that's right, you said the right thing. Not that, oh, I got, oh, got to watch that. Can't say those words. Or even worse, we pull up the skull and you all get to peer inside. What's going on in here? What version of reality is he running inside his crazy mind? He's doing what? He, oh, just thinking about it. That doesn't count, right? Wait a minute. David is saying, I want my thoughts to bring you glory. What I'm thinking about to bring you glory, Lord. Again, we go back into Romans. Romans chapter 12. Turn to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to kind of get close to concluding with just this. Paul's picking up the same idea. He says, and don't be conformed to this world. In other words, don't, don't fit into the pie pan of this world and be molded by it but be transformed by the renewing of your mind be changed by changing your thinking that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god do the thoughts of my mind reflect the will of god do the words of my mouth reflect the will of god do the things that we say do that. That's the challenge. That's the application that David comes away. And David didn't have the challenge of the iPhone. David didn't have the issues that we have, but David had the same problems of the heart issues that we face today. He's got the same things. And he found the solution is God's Word. I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to think about it. I needed to, to pursue after what He's revealed. There is a God. He's told me how to have a relationship with Him. I want that relation. And I want that relation to where He recognizes it and I'm, I'm showing what's acceptable. And He would be proud of me. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you would like one, myself and there's other people sitting around here would be happy to share with you and tell you how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We assume since we all come to church that that's, everybody has one. 
This isn't, I'm not a person who pressures people. I should be though. No, but I don't, but I'm not. But it's one of those things that an individual has to make because I had to individually make it and so did you. So, if the message speaks to your heart, if God is speaking to your heart, and you'd like to talk more about it, I'm available to speak to you. You can call me or you can come visit me. I'd be happy to talk to you about these great truths. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we see in Psalm 19. Thank you for the way you preserved it and you've kept it and been an encouragement for us. We have a wonderful sunny day today in which we're all going to leave and we ask for your, your protection and guidance. May, the, may your word, the Bible, not be sat down on a coffee table for the whole week and not picked up to be enjoyed and read and meditated over this week. Lord, we, we thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.